We take this very serious because, again, we are fans ourselves. So what we're here today uh, to talk about is the Combiner Wars, and our uh, and we are just very, very excited about this because we feel that we've done so much with the Transformers. It's such a big part of pop culture, and through our movies, through the uh, animation series that we've been doing, this ongoing animated series, we have merchandise, we have comic books, we have... We touch on practically every type of medium with Transformers. But the uh, one thing that we've been looking for is to get into digital content storytelling. So we really wanted to find a partner that was the state of the art in the forefront of digital story content. And we found that with Machinima, because Machinima truly is a uh, for the fans, by the fans, and they are some of the leading creative in this field. So we're very excited to have them and, uh, and explain and share with you what we've come up with. So anyway, get, uh, what I want to do is I want to start introducing our panel here, which we'll start with John Ward, who is our Hasbro Design Manager. who is our producer, and this guy, he has a resume that's too long to list, but he has been a producer and writer on tons of different animated series, including Afro Samurai, that was on Spike TV. Then we have George Prisic, he's the head writer on the series. that he's written and produced from, uh, what is it, Speed Racer, Clone Wars, uh, Downtown for MTV, Five Tours, like I said, goes on and on. Mm -hmm. so, welcome. Then we have <laughs> F.J. DeSanto. Now, F.J. is on so He's our series writer, and he has been an integral part of the, uh, the Batman franchise that we've all seen and loved as well as the Constantine and the Spirit movie. He's been a writer for PC Comics and Boom Studios and currently serves president and head of development for Silver Fox Entertainment. Then we have uh, the guy named Wilton Glasses. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jason. Clearly, clearly he might not. Yeah, 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 but he can see us. Um, Marnoka. All right, so Manoka is an actor and writer known best for his work in Bat in the Sun as well as Thorn of Atlantis. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. And we have Abby Trunks, another fine voice actress who plays Windblade. So anyway, John, I want to know how did we, you know, we have many different stories in the uh, the universe, and where does this story fit in? Well, the universe of Minor Wars, really, when we kicked this thing off, uh, we wanted it to be set in a place that I think uh, comic book fans are going to be familiar with, the IDW universe, it's that sort of the time period beyond the Earth Wars, uh, the settlers are coming back to Cybertron, and they're sort of a loose uh, society there, I think it allows you to play in a different uh, space. And when we work on the toys, we want to bring, it's, it, it's a lot of these characters that people know from the original G1 series, but you've got a brand new energy that comes to the table, a little more sophistication, both in detail, level of transformation. And we knew that this was the right space to play in for this, uh, this time period. Um, it's a really interesting, gritty setting that you, that we're going to try to play out in a really great way. And uh, it's, it's been incredible to work with uh, with the team here. They're, they're just like the perfect fit. When they came into Hasbro and we did like this writer's room, uh, 
I kind of like walk through all the different, you know, the 13 primes and the general history that is outlined in the Covenant of Primus and all of that stuff. And these guys listened to every nerdy bit of information that I gave to them, which was great. And I knew right away that these guys are the right type of storytellers because they really, really understand the beating heart behind, behind Transformers. Transformers is not just about the humans uh, and the people around them. So yeah. I didn't wrap up, but a really short story about when we came to the writers' room. <laughs> so we, we flew out there and this massive presentation, this, this room like almost as big as this, with with all all the current lineup and the art and everything. And there was at least 50 people in there, or it felt like 50. <laughs> and we we're like, oh my god, what if we walked into this at the Star Chamber? And uh, like the first 20 minutes were really tense because I think that you guys were like, who are these Hollywood guys? They don't know our IP. They don't know, you know, the Transformers. And like after 20 minutes of us just hardcore nerding out and showing them pictures of our collection, they're like, okay, all right, these are our people. <laughs> they know Transformers. So that that was that was kind of awesome for us. Yeah, that was still a very deep. deep that was right. Right. Yeah, I mean that that, that, that was right because the, the room was surrounded with boards that uh, John had put together with all of these different. Uh, Parts of our lore, from artifacts to all the different characters and the different uh, species throughout the universe, and um, and it was was it one day? Did we do it in one day or two days? I mean, that that might have been. Oh, because I just remember ordering. Yeah, we were having lunch come in and so forth, and I thought we were gonna have bed cots come in for for us to sleep over, and it was just really that deep dive. Uh, so security stops George from stealing toys. After. No, yeah, yeah, John stopped him from putting toys in his pocket. Oh yeah, we didn't have to lock up the toys for you guys. But the, um, but again, getting back to the story, I mean, so, Eric, and can you tell us where does this really kind of fit into the universe? And where, where, where was the, what was your object, objective to creating this? Where did it start? So uh, when we decided to make this uh, combine or more story, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges and one of the things that we're really excited about, there's so many characters. There's so much to work on, but um, you know, George and I and MJ, we really sat down and we said, uh, if you're going to do a sophisticated story, you're going to do something that's really focused on adults. It has to be about somebody. It has to be someone's tale, someone's emotional journey, someone's sophisticated journey. And you know, I spent my entire career really trying to bring adult animation to you know America. You know, I was working in Japan for many years, and I did Afro Samurai. I did one of the uh, Lincoln Park music videos. I did the Witchblade anime. And like, my whole goal was, you know, Americans are ready for animation that is uh, geared for adults. So, you know, we knew that with these characters, we could do that. So, you know, our goal, and I guess the kind of story we wanted to tell was really, was really about Windblade, I suppose, and that was really our key point of view. That would be the, the focal point. You know, there's a giant war happening, there's all these characters, but in the middle of that is a character uh, with a problem, and with an issue, and with a mission of vengeance. So I guess if that, Answer your question. That's that's what we. That's the story that we want to tell. Yeah, but uh, let, let me just clarify one thing. Cause you'll know that I'm the one who kept. You know, we have a lot of conversations, ongoing conversations, almost on a daily basis, whether uh, it's on the phone or emails. But one of the things that was really important about this animated series is that it is for everyone, right? I mean, but we wanted to tell a deeper and more sophisticated story that was going to just kind of just wow everybody and really remind everybody what made us fall in love with Transformers in the first place, All right? So we, and I think we've, uh, I think this team has really done a great job uh, capturing uh, the magic of why, why this property is so special to all of us. So anyway, uh, did you want to add on to the uh, story of George? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, some of the some of the things that we were wrestling with as fans and also as uh, creatives who wanted to push the IP forward is, um, you know, we we have to be respectful of the legacy, but also we want to tell new stories. We also want to see our characters change. So when we did that, we were very focused about some kind of core principles, and one of them was, you know, what David mentioned is we wanted to make sure that this was um, accessible to a broad audience. So let's say you're a G1 fan or something. Let's say you only know the movies and something there for you. Let's say you're only four and all you know is like the design of this prime. Hopefully there's something there for you as well. Uh, the other aspect is a global audience. So we wanted to uh, kind of uh, hook the series and kind of uh, base it on a core emotional aspects of just human life. So it doesn't matter what your background or culture is, you can kind of 
understand you know someone took something away from you and you want revenge or you know you uh, have have a father father daughter relationship things like this um, and then the third thing that we did is we distilled all of our characters and our situations down to four essential pillars uh, so we would not make mistakes you know we, we had numerous discussions with these guys and among ourselves what would optimus do what would wouldn't they do what wouldn't they do so that we would not damage the IP, but at the same time we were growing it. Um, so we were kind of very, very focused about what we were doing. We weren't being haphazard, and I think that comes from being fans and, and being burned. Like, you know, I've had my heart broken. I'm sure you guys have had, had your hearts broken with other IPs, and we didn't want to do that. And uh, Jay, I'm sure you have a lot more to say about that. No, I don't have much to do so well. But the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the key was, what George was saying, when we sort of distilled it down, you know, to the, to the core aspects is not just, you know, as fans, we say, what do we want to see these characters do? And how do we bring something new and fresh to it, particularly, and I'm trying to do this without giving away spoilers, but in particular, you know, what is the combiner rules? You know, what is this about? What is, you know, what are the dynamics of these combiners in particular that's a great thing for us? So we did a lot of homework where we went through, you know, years and years of, you know, these characters and what did they mean and who, and we were very, meticulous in which characters we picked to be in this because they could bring a dynamic and an emotional arc to it. Um, again, trying to do this without spoiling it too much, but in particular, Windblade has sort of your eyes into this world, into this war, etc., and how it also affects characters who are familiar with like Optimus and, and Megatron. I don't know if I'm allowed to even say these characters are really good. Well, with all this uh, talking about the machine and the uh, combiner wars, um, just to see it trailer. Yeah. So, Ooh, Eric, wow. Eric, can you set this up? Please? Sure. So, before we do that, I'd like to ask a, a G1 fans. Yeah, so explain. Yeah. Come on, some of the Skies fans.
Absolutely. Um, so we did introduce a new character called Maxima, and she, uh, sorry, we've been told that I'm not talking about it. So you have a very soft voice. <laughs> we have a, a new character called Maxima, and she is uh, kind of the right hand wing lady. Um, and she kind of, it, we somewhat we took inspiration from the Combiner Hunters uh, aspect of the IDW comics. So she's a Combiner Hunter, uh, for lack of a better term. And she's, uh, we, we felt that she was a very cool character because she's absolutely dedicated to what Windblade is doing, even when Windblade kind of questions who and what she is. Um, so we're able to explore kind of the, the, the harder edge aspect of the war and uh, following, you know, leaders into that. So, FJ, what, uh, which characters do you enjoy working with when you're writing? Oh, it's all of them in their own way because we're trying to put, bring something new to each one. And I think the interesting one for me was Starscream. I think that was the most fun to sort of figure out, you know, who this character is and what his place is in the world at this point. But also, there was a lot of fun sort of fleshing out the, the combiner character in particular, because I mean that's what the title is, Combiner Wars, so you want to figure out who, like I was saying before, who are these guys, so some of them are Victorian. So I just want to make sure, again, I don't want to be the spoiler guy that ever, oh, and then, you know, so, you know, characters like Victorian in particular, and, you know, figuring out what it is to be a combiner and what are, the, what are the aspects of that. We did a lot of work sort of dissecting, you know, who these characters are and why these combiners exist and why there's this war. So there was a lot of fun sort of building characters from that. Um, because we have a bunch of characters that I don't know when they should be before, like just playing and stuff like that. You know, I'm gonna throw in a really, uh, in the first episode, we uh, highlight Menasaur. And uh, what I really liked about, you know, Menasaur is he's built of Stunticon. And he's kind of crazy, and uh, he's, he's really out of control naturally. And, you know, uh, since we all work at Machina, you know, we have all this access to all this, like, brand new, cool talent and everything. And do you guys know who Dashy Games is on YouTube? So anyway, he's, he's amazing, like, you know, the, the talent department of Machine was like, hey, look at some of the guys we can use, and, and Dashy basically just, like, screams at video games, you know, like, at the top of his voice, and he's, I was like, I'm not gonna like this, and I watched, like, all of his videos, he's really, really funny, and him doing Menasaur was, like, really a perfect combination, because, you know, it's this classic character that we knew, this classic character that we've been, we've seen in the animation and stuff like that, but I always just thought I was afraid of he was never wild enough. He was never like out of control. And the whole point of Combiner Wars is that they're they're all kind of nuts. If you think about it, I mean, even Computron or Computron's my favorite. Then you know, I mean, he's he's. So let me get this right. He combines and he gets smarter. That's right. Which I just like that's. <laughs> you know, so it's like, like having these YouTube talent do these voices. It was like a perfect combo. That's uh, interesting. You know, I don't hear any love for Megatron. <laughs> You know, next to <laughs> FJ, we, I've got to introduce that he's the voice of Megatron. Woo! So, can you share with us what it was like to be such a badass? As Megatron? Oh, as Megatron? I thought you just meant in general. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was kind of an interesting challenge because um, I remember that, you know, we were specifying kind of what we wanted him to sound like, and, you know, I didn't really... Um, uh, I wasn't familiar with Combiner Wars as a, as a series, so I had to kind of look. I was like, okay, what, what do the toys look like? Well, that's what they look like. Okay, so we might sound like this, and we kind of figured it out from there. Um, but it kind of, at first, was a little bit of a heavy burden because it is Megatron. You know, but I had a great time. Um, I think what made, you know, to, to help him out a little yeah, bit, you know, yeah. when we were writing Megatron, you know, I mean, the thing about Megatron in the classic series is, you know, he was a megalomaniac, he always had this plan, he always really wanted to do these terrible things, and he had this kind of like raspy kind of grandfather voice, right? But then in the movies when he was played by Hugo Weaving, he had more of a gravel and he was more of a, a heavy sounding character, so it was, a, it was a different voice. But in our series, I mean, Megatron is a really different voice emotionally, and he's got a very specific arc to carry, and, you know, he's kind of satisfied with life. Yeah. You know, I so think that's actually what kind of sold him me out was when you said he's satisfied. Okay, so we have to play him like this now. So I think that that was probably the most helpful word for him. Yeah, now 
one of the characters that we're really excited about, of course, is Wendy Lee. Woo! Yeah! a character that, uh, you know, we listened to the fans, and we brought in this uh, female character, and she is just an amazing character that uh, Abby got to play. So, Abby, what was it like to take on the responsibility of doing Wendy Lee that, that's so beloved now? It was kind of, like the whole thing is done in 40 minutes, right? And to create a story arc within that time and like the dynamics within that um, is a hard task. And I think that our writers did an amazing job, which, um, and talking to the direction in which we wanted to take with Blade, talking to Eric about this, um, we thought it would be a, a, a good idea to approach it um, in kind of a melodramatic sense, but not, not really melodrama. Um, I have a history with Japan, and there's a style of acting, a history. Um, history. No, it's all good. There's a kind of a, a different style of acting that, for lack of a better term, we would describe as melodrama, but it's not. It's just like it, it's more extreme emotion. And um, Winley is is faced with a situation where she's really at the last straw, and she needs to do something about it. She she feels obligated to act, and. Um, I think that it was really difficult to create a character with all of those emotions of sadness and anger and vengeance and almost desperation. Um, and I think that to achieve that, we went to almost a melodramatic realm. But I, would, I don't like the word melodrama. <laughs> Extreme emotion um, and a range of emotion. Um, and I don't think I told the story, Eric, but when I was oh, auditioning for this character, <laughs> So, um, I, in college, I studied the style of acting um, by Tadashi Suzuki. I don't know if anybody has heard of Tadashi Suzuki, but it's about creating a physical struggle within yourself. And um, it, it's a lot of focus on the voice and using the physical struggle within yourself and kind of overcoming that and speaking through it. And sometimes you can hear the struggle in your voice and it, it really carries more impact than the voice. And when I was auditioning for this character, I resorted to Suzuki method to try to get in there, to get into that grit, to get into that anger, that desperation, the sadness, to get it all in there. Um, and that really helped me. Also, Eric mentioned before maybe that I've been doing a lot of anime dubs, and that style of acting kind of comes through a little bit in here, where it's a little bit more emotional at times. And, um, so, Are you guys great. anime fans, by the way? Anime fans? Woo! Yeah. Woo! So I just want to let you guys know that um, the entire Transformers Combining Wars is actually produced completely in Japan. So we have a, a Japanese director, uh, we have a production studio called Tatsunoko Productions. And um, one thing that they really, really love doing is the Windblade character. You know, because I'm a huge anime fan, and you know, having a character with all these giant steps emotionally. I mean, you know, Windblade is furious. And she is horribly sad, and then she's, you know, very uh, sorrowful and, and regretful and happy, and so all these ranges of, of emotion. You know, I kind of wanted to bring the Transformers. You know, I, I, I love, you know, watching all the series, but I was like, oh, I want to bring that. In, in Japanese, they call it wet. You know, it's like this really raw emotional touch. So, um, have any of you guys watched the prelude to the Combiner Wars, the lead up we put up on YouTube? Yeah. That's good. So if you, if you see those and you see you know the performances of our different characters, you know um, you know the, uh, actually Frank Tadar here is our star screen. Frank, please stand up. So, he actually is uh, in the episode, and Abby does an episode. You can really get into the emotion that you're trying to tell. So right, Eric, Eric, can we uh, get because we want to get to the uh, something that we want to share with the fans. So can you set this up for us? I mean, what was the uh, uh, you know, the, how, how is it the, and you're, you're trying to bring some original voice to this, right? You, you, you're trying to, and, and, and of course, you guys did a successful job of bringing your own talent and, and shaping it um, to reflect your fandom for this, as well as an original story. But how did you balance this with the uh, existing IDW, which is what this is kind of inspired for? Um, well, I think that, um, you know, 
All right, so um, we are going to show you another. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So I'm going to add your question, and then we're going to show you another clip. Right. So um, cartoons are coming again, which is good. So this is a, a very good question, a very difficult question. Um, I was recently watching the. The trailer for uh, Star Wars Rogue One, and the director, Gareth Edwards, has this quote where he says, uh, Empire Strikes Back is one of the fa his favorite movies of all time, but if you love something too much, if you are too attached to it, that you are afraid as a creator to bring something new, to dare to try different things, then what do you bring to the table? And I think about that a lot, and I thought about that as we made the series, that every step is, what do we hold on, what do we bring new? And you know, for example, Megatron, like that old gray outfit and that helmet and that face, like I could never change. It was so close to what that character meant to me from the 80s. But at the same time, um, his legs, as you guys know, are based on the Walter PK pistol. You know, so they're this wide black shape. He does no longer take the shape of a Walter PK because it's not appropriate for kids today to have a toy that turns into a gun. So, you know, he has a different shape when he transforms, but I illogically had to keep the original Walter PK legs because that is Megatron. You know, so I think as you watch this next one, thank you, I got a oh guy <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, dude. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, let me set up this clip for you and, and what you're about to see. So in the IDW comics and, the, and then the overall franchise, we all know the combiners are out of control, right? So in our series, uh, at the beginning of this scene, uh, Menasaur is raging through, as he does, and he lands on planet Chemnus to discover that there are some Chemians who are not happy about him. Ready enough? Ready to watch? Yeah. Okay, this is your exclusive look at Combiner Wars Episode 1. Now, 
one thing I do want to ask, I mean, Abby got to share with us what it meant to really find her voice in this with, with uh, one way. Uh, Jason, you know, how, what did you bring, what was it that you wanted to bring to Megatron that was going to elucidate uh, your own? Well, um, I think what, uh, what we, you know, we sort of discussed how the voice ended up working out and, you know, the sort of growl, we wanted to bring that down because, you know, he's a little more chill now. So I think, um, I, I really wasn't sure what, uh, auditioning wise, um, you know, it specified, you know, try not to think of uh, previous incarnations, try and, you know, uh, do something different with it. So, you know, and then once I found out more about what we were doing with Megatron, I thought that we found a voice that fit well for what we were doing. And, um, but it was still kind of a big challenge because, you know, it's, it's like a try. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like he can't sound too, too much one way or the other. And so I think what we found was a nice balance uh, in between. And I'm, I'm pretty satisfied. I think the key direction was do shit up. Oh, yeah. Oh, you yeah. Know, is that I would do so many times. I would do a take and then you'd be like, uh, do shit up, please. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, all right. You know, a couple takes in. You were yeah. oddly comfortable with douching it up. Well, which. Yeah. 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 yeah, we have to have yeah. All right, so one last question before we go uh, to a Q&A. Can each of you tell, just share a little bit as to what was a special moment during this whole development and uh, production of this animated series? John, starting with you. Uh, just to keep it brief, really it's exciting in any way, shape, or form to see your creation come to life. And when we were working with these guys, I would, I would literally, literally send them images of the toys, and then to see them bring it to life and bring character to a lot of the toys that I was creating, I mean, it was intense. Like, when I first saw Victorian, and I thought about the fans who created her, and, and the heart that so many different artists put into it, and then I see Spin it, and I thought to myself, my God, this is real, it's incredible. <laughs>